Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. Good to morning. Musician peak performance. Morning. Great to see you all. And welcome to everybody on Facebook, where we are streaming live. Cool. Where can I find it on Facebook, Rupal? Let me know. <laughs> yeah, Sammy can put the link in. Yeah. Uh, okay. So many familiar faces. I feel like we're really getting to know you guys over this <laughs> daily uh, challenge. And lots of people we already know. Lots of our awesome alums. So good to see you guys. Yay. Yeah, say hi in the chat. Let us know if this is how well, your day's going. I guess you would have already told us. Yeah, if this was your first event. So uh, today's day four. It is Thursday morning. Uh, and we are going to go at enormous amounts of speed this morning for multiple reasons. Mostly to, you know, get you guys excited about things. Uh, hi, Laurie. How's the baby? Not a baby anymore, right? Going well. Okay. Cool. <clears throat> okay. So... That's me. You all know who you're dealing with by now. Uh, so we don't need that slide. And this is our team behind the scenes. It's amazing how much work goes on to uh, to present these uh, these sessions and to put on our program. Uh, and we're uh, <clears throat> we're very excited and and very proud actually of the fact of the fact that over the course of the pandemic we've uh, we've been able to work with some you know really incredibly talented. Uh, young people to help, uh, you know, help involve them in our in our project and and get experience working in business, working in the arts, working in arts administration. Uh, Sammy obviously has previous experience working in the arts and and she does an amazing job holding everything together for us. Um, but uh, yeah, we're very proud of the fact that um, that we've been able to work with uh, with so many cool people behind the scenes and. Um, and build their skill set as well as as well as work with all of you in the in the Zoom room uh, in in our in our sessions and uh, in our individual work. So recapping where we are at the moment, we've had three fantastic days. Uh, it's been great to see how engaged everyone's been uh, in the Facebook group, sending videos, putting up. Uh, videos of your performance and sharing ideas with us uh, on the email. Uh, if you if you have recorded stuff and you've forgotten to put it in the in the Facebook group, please do. Uh, it's really cool. I get to see all of those. Uh, everyone gets to see all those. And please, if you if you have ideas that can help someone, um, that is what that group is there for. You can uh, you can respond to to other people's uh, posts and, and help them with their with their playing development as well. So on day one, we talked about the foundation. Everything is coming back to, in terms of technique, what is simple, natural, and repeatable? If we keep asking ourselves that question when we're doing technical things, we're gonna end up with good outcomes. And we're gonna be able to prevent doing things that are gonna let us down when we're under pressure. The building blocks in our technique, air, lips, and tongue, really, really simple. The overarching, theme that we saw on the first slide let me go back to that for you for a second of course is the musical physical and mental side of what we're doing this is what we're building up this week we started with the technique side the physical side yesterday we worked a lot on the musical elements and today is going to be moving on to the mental side of things so on day two we talked about five ways of success making sure that we can play anything that we're preparing Way too little, too little, just right, the Goldilocks tempo or the Goldilocks dynamic or the Goldilocks uh, range, whatever, whichever, whichever of these, uh, or the, the style, uh, and then too much and then way too much. So that if a conductor or if a pianist or if, uh, if the committee in an audition decide to ask you to do something differently, you're going to have that flexibility. Uh, and it's already built into your preparation. And it's also gonna help you to learn things much quicker, much more stably. And then when you get back to your Goldilocks tempo or your Goldilocks uh, zone, uh, it's gonna feel really, really comfortable. Uh, and you're gonna have plenty of room either side uh, to give you that uh, stability and support in your playing. 
So tying it all together is what we talked about in terms of technique. So we want to establish the habits away from the instrument, execute the skill into the instrument, expand them through exercises, put a little bit of pressure, remembering everything we do has to be a little bit difficult so that, so that we're training our brain to build strength in these, uh, in these techniques and, and to build the habit in a strong, positive way. And then applying those skills to studies and etudes, again, further expanding them, and then we deliver them in performance or deliver them into pieces and excerpts. Yesterday, we started looking at the musical side of things, asking ourselves, what is the character of the, the piece that we're playing? If you haven't done that yet, take a little bit of time. We talked, about, we talked about some interesting ways of getting to the character. But most importantly, eventually, the goal is to get to our own character, where we own our version of the piece or the excerpt. And then one of the drills that we used yesterday was, um, was a fun one. You guys did an amazing job. Uh, with your singing and conducting. It was really cool to watch. Uh, so the maestro and singer method. So we sing, conduct, blow or bow it. And then finger it on the instrument and then move on to playing. So reviewing our assignment for yesterday. Okay, let's, who did the assignment? Hands up. I saw some of these, of course, in the in the uh, in the Facebook group. So I know I know who you are, who did it. So I am watching, uh, and it was great. There was some awesome playing, really fantastic stuff. Some beautiful, really, really beautiful playing, and some difficult things. Eric, your piece I'd never heard before. That was really cool. Thank you for posting that. It was it was great and great playing. Uh, so obviously, you don't have to. Put it in uh, to the uh, into the Facebook group if you don't want to. But I would really encourage you to record yourself in this process so that you really can chart your your development, your improvement across the week. And getting into the habit, and it's not something we're going to talk about this week. We do talk about it a lot in the in the summer program. Um, the best way to utilize recording device for your practice. But suffice it to say, it's really 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 important to to record yourself as often as you can and listen back no use in recording it and then not listening back that doesn't help <laughs> although that's what we wish we could do right sometimes sometimes i wish like i'm just going to record it and then it's just gone and i'm not going to imagine that i imagine that it never happened the the important information is listening back and the more often we do it the more comfortable we get with listening to ourselves who likes who enjoys listening to themselves play very rare. Dano, Dano is like, yeah, yeah, I love it. It's great. You, yeah, okay. But that's, you sound great, so that's okay. I hate it. Every every one of our concerts in the LA Phil is recorded for archival purposes or for on the radio or for CD. And there, I'm still yet to hear anything where I'm like, wow, everything was exactly how I wanted it. Never happens. But it is such a great tool. I can, within a couple of hours of a concert, I can go onto our portal and I can listen to the performance that we played that night and I can fix so many things for the next day. It's such a useful thing. Whitney Crockett uh, actually records, when he's got big solo stuff with big, huge things for bassoon, he actually puts his phone on his stand. I can't, this is actually, I'm not saying this, this never happened. We wipe this from the records. But now he'll actually record his rehearsals and listen back to the rehearsal so that he can make the adjustments before the concerts. Obviously this is this is a really you know a really good way to do things. So recording your phone does sound bad, yes. But remember if we put it in the right context, we're not listening for perfect performance, we're listening for information. We're listening for what are those things of rhythm, intonation, stability of the sound, uh, consistency, you know, throughout the range. These things it doesn't. You don't need a high quality uh, recording device to be able to pick that up and to be able to get really, really useful information that you can put back into your performance and continue to improve. So record yourself in this process. Record yourself every day, uh, and sometimes you may re record yourself and go, "Wow, actually, I sound really great." Important thing I think at the end of this process is take the recording from day one, play it up against the recording on day five, and go like, "Wow, this is." 
pretty cool. I've made really great progress. And I'm sure if you follow what we're talking about, if you implement these tools, uh, there, there is no way that uh, you can't make really significant improvement. Okay, back to... So the assignment was practice your piece of exit using the Maestro Singer method. Was that fun to do? Share what you discovered from that. Show of hands, you can have a chat with us or you can put it in the chat. I find it really frees up my <clears throat> my musical expression. If I if I can sing it really clearly, also I discover from the singing, you know, how well I actually know it. Can't conduct it singing at the same time. Yeah, it always <clears throat> it always amazes me this like people like Elton John who can play the piano and sing at the same time. I can't, I have no chance of doing that ever. Um, but uh, yeah, if, if you, um, you know, if you had a discovery that happened overnight, yeah, Christy, good morning. Yeah, hey guys. So one thing that I did, um, not only did I sing it, but sometimes I, I, I pick my favorite recording of the excerpt or, or whatever piece I'm working on and I'll actually dance to it I'm a very like physical person I move my hands a lot and I dance around and so I like to do a little bit of the conducting portion but like around the whole room with my whole body and it really helps to get the musicality for me into how I want to play it and then it's a lot easier because my whole body has been a part of it to put it through the instrument or through the mouthpiece in the air that way awesome yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's amazing. Yeah, so I mean, the important part about this process that we're talking about this week is that I want you guys to experiment with what works for you. And this is something we talk about in the summer program is that there are so many ideas out there. You can you can, you know, go on YouTube and get ideas from great players, you can get ideas from, you know, different different, totally different artists, um, sports people, and bringing these into what, what makes sense for you, experimenting with them and finding out, oh, this particular idea resonates. Or, or you know, Andrew uses this idea, I don't, it, it doesn't work for me, but this other idea does. So that we find out what works for ourselves. There is no, there's no one size fits all uh, when we talk about developing our playing. But it's, if we're open to this idea of experimenting, trying things, and one of the things that we've talked a lot about in the, in the program is how we can put it into structure, how, how we can have a plan that all of this information can fit into and we use it to help our continued improvement. So, sing, conduct, blow, finger on the instrument, play. That was the assignment. So today we're talking about awareness. And there's a little graphic of what your brain does. So Rupal has on her computer, uh, she has a really cool one of these that's that's much more artsy. And the and the right brain is the right brain has like colours and like it's very extravagant and the and the left brain is just grey and very <laughs> dry. And this is pretty much a, it's pretty much what you know what goes on in our in our brain. So the left side of our brain is very very good for problem solving, um, mathematics, these these sort of detail oriented things. And it is important in our practice that we activate our left brain. In in terms of performance, our right brain is obviously the area where we would like to be working most of the time. It's much more the emotional side, the the feeling that tactile side, the uh, you know artistic side, creative side of, of what we do. So how does that impact our awareness? We can use both sides of the brain in our practice and in our performance. When we're practicing, for me, I wanna make sure that I'm using at least a significant part of the time in my technique practice, I wanna be using the left side of my brain. I wanna be finding out you know, what is going on? What are the elements that I'm putting in? What are the, you know, what are the technical things that I want to make sure that I'm taking care of? 
And then I want to over time transition this so that in performance, I'm letting all of that go. I'm trusting the work that I did with my left brain. And I'm trying to immerse myself in my right brain and just let happen, let, let my habits happen, which is why we spent so much time in the first couple of days talking about building the habits in a, in a stable and productive way, going back to simple, natural and repeatable. Because if we build good habits, then when we're in a performance situation, we can trust those habits and we know that they're going to work well and we can just immerse ourselves in the musical side and the emotional side of what we're doing. So, awareness in the practice room. So this is, this is something that, you know, to me is, is really important, not only you know, I went through a time when I was when I was a student where I would be like, I'm going to practice three hours a day, every day, and I'm going to be really committed to it. And I reckon probably two hours and 45 minutes of that practice was wasted time. Because I was just like bashing through stuff. And, you know, I thought the longer I played, the better I would get the harder the pieces I played, the better I would get. So if I played something really difficult, that would make everything else really easy, right? Well, it's sort of the same philosophy of, you know, if you bang your head into a brick wall and you stop, it feels a lot better. But, but you still end up with a sore head. And this was basically my practice philosophy when I was a student until I realized that if I created more awareness of what I was doing in the practice room, I was able to steer my practice in a much more productive way. So the first thing that most of us struggle with is focus and concentration when we practice. Anyone suffer from that in any way? Oh, there you go. Who would have thought? I mean, I suffer from this in a concert. So in the practice room, you know, where I've got no real impetus to actually stay focused externally, imagine what happens. So a little experiment for you guys um, overnight, and I didn't put this in the homework, but, I, but I'd love for you to do it. If you've got it, and, and the people who, who have been in our programs before will know this drill, and they probably still have one. Daniel, you probably got one somewhere. Um, Fred would probably have one lying around. If you've got a, I don't have one with me. Hang on, let me see if I'm not here. No, don't have one. Um, rubber band. Everyone's got a rubber band in their house. Next time, so, so tonight or this afternoon when you go into your practice room, take your rubber band and put it around your wrist. And every time that you get distracted, and so what is a distraction in our practice? Put in the chat what, what you get distracted by in your practice. For me, it's about 7,000 things. It's like, oh, I've got to make sure I do the washing. Oh, what, now I've got to remember to pick up the kids. Um, oh, yeah, now what is the river toy doing next week? Oh, that's right, I've got to make sure. It's like, like a little yeah, chipmunk I've got running around in my head. This is not going to help me to practice. It's not going to help me to stay in the moment. <clears throat> so what I do is every time I, if I'm really struggling with practice or I really need to get something done and be focused, Put a rubber band on your wrist and every time you drift off, snap the rubber band onto your wrist. What you'll find is, and probably by tomorrow I'll end up with all these emails of like, Andrew, I've got, you've, you've, I've got a welt on my hand that and it's all your fault. I would be happy if that's the case because that means that you're, you're creating more awareness. So, so the, every time you snap, snap the, um, you know, the rubber band on your wrist, it's going to bring you back into now. What am I supposed to be doing? Andrew, we've got to, we've got to learn Strauss too in a month. Let's get it together. Okay. So I need to not be thinking about what I'm doing tomorrow. I need to not be thinking about what's going on this afternoon. I need to be focusing on what is happening right now. So experiment with that in your next practice session and you'll be surprised firstly how distracted you are and then how unaware you were of that distraction. How many times have you come out of a practice session and had no idea what you just did? You went through your technique routine and it's like, oh yeah, well, that's, I just went through that. And it's like, did I, how did I breathe? How did I blow? How did I, 
was my tongue position okay? So this is the first step in bringing this concentration back so that we can focus on the things that are going to be productive for us. Because I don't know about you, but if I have the choice of doing four hours practice or playing around a golf, see where I'm going with this? I would be choosing golf. The problem is I need the four hours practice in order to keep my job. So it needs to get done. So I need to make the most out of that time. There is no need for us to waste time in the practice room. So being as efficient, being as focused as we can and getting the most progress we can in that session is what is really important. Otherwise, go and play golf. Because if you're not focused in your practice, you're probably going to make more benefit on the golf course because you'll be more relaxed, have a good time. And you won't be putting any bad habits into your playing. Right? Eric, good morning. Okay. Uh, I find uh, when I'm in that little sweet spot where you're really focused, time seems to go by really fast. It's just like you're ultra focused and that the time just goes by. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it is quite it's quite amazing. Uh, I find this in in you know, and you guys think about it in rehearsal as well, right? In rehearsal, if you if you've got a really engaging conductor, you're playing a piece that you're really into, you're focused on the piece, your energy is high. Three hour rehearsal goes by in a second. You're like, wow, that was really fast. If you've got a conductor who's not so interesting, the piece that's boring, you sit around doing nothing. You know, ten minutes feels like you've been there for an hour. It's the same thing with practice. So if we're struggling with a little bit of awareness of this and, and a little bit of focus in our practice, one of the ideas is to break your practice up into shorter chunks. Make your practice no more than half an hour because we can't concentrate for that and break that practice up into five minute segments. Don't do more than five minutes on something and then move on to something else. This is a very, very simple method uh, that is initially was used in, in fitness, right? It's just interval training. I can run almost a uh, hundred meters down the street at my fastest speed, right? For a hundred meters, anyone can run as fast as they can, knowing that in a hundred meters time you get to stop. But if I said you were going to go on a 5,000 yard run, would you start off at the same speed? No way, because you know that after a while you're going to you're going to conk out. You're going to not be able to do it. Right. So you would start at a slower speed. It's the same with practice. If we start off with well, I'm just going to practice Mozart for half an hour. We're not going to we're not going to work with the intensity, with the focus, with the awareness that we need to get the most amount of progress because you're like, oh, yeah, I've got half an hour to fix this. Whereas if you said I've got five minutes to work on Mozart. And then I cut it off and I have to move on to the next thing. Imagine the amount of urgency, the amount of focus, the amount of tension that you're going to have in that five minutes, knowing that at the end of five minutes, you, you get to move on. So these are things that can really help us in our practice, but the rubber band is very, very useful in terms of us creating this awareness. Okay. so. We talked about the distraction thing, developing technical elements, awareness in, in, in correcting and, and uh, developing our technical elements is, is super important. So that once, once we've sort of broken down this distraction, then we can actually get onto, all right, what are the elements that I want to focus on? And am I aware of that? And what is distracting me from that? Often we get distracted. We talked about this in the first couple of days. Often I get distracted by the result. Did it sound good, right? Instead of what am I focusing on? My breathing and my blowing. I can see from the videos that are put up and it's some fantastic playing, but you can see some people's, probably all of our breathing could do some, with some work, right? Because when we're recording, what are we thinking about? We're thinking about making sure we get the notes and making a good sound. Right. So in our practice, we want to make sure that we're aware of the elements that we want to implement and put focus on that. And then in our practice, and this is something for you again to be, you know, just 
think about when you're, when you're next in the practice room, identifying the causes of our mistakes. So what we tend to do is when we practice, we practice something, we make a mistake, we stop, and we go back and do it again. Anyone guilty of that? Anyone do that in their practice? Yeah. Great. Well, you might get lucky and you might fix it. You might fix the symptom in that you'll get the right notes, but you're not necessarily fixing the cause of the problem because the cause of the problem may still be there. You've just managed to get around it by playing it again. So the next time that you're in the practice room and you make a mistake and you want to stop, that's fine. But go through your simple, natural and repeatable process. Go through and, and try and think about, okay, how was my breathing? How was my release of the air? Was my setup good? What was going on with my tongue? Did I have a good musical image before I started? Right, and pretty quickly, you, the qu the answer will be. I guarantee you, the first time you go through this, the answer will be, I don't know. I'm not sure. And at that point, bing, all the lights should go on and flash, and be like, okay, now we need to find out. And that's fine. It's fine not to know. But what's not fine is for us not to try and discover what it is. So, for example. Oftentimes, the most difficult note for us to play, particularly as brass players or as wind players, actually in any instrument, right? What's the most difficult note to play? The first note of a phrase, right? First note of a phrase. So our focus is on that first note of the phrase. How do we, how do we give ourselves the best opportunity to play that note well? Well, as a horn player, I've got to breathe well, I've got to get organized, and I blow through that setup. But why is my focus? My focus is on, I've got to make sure, God, I hope I get this note and I've got to grab onto it, right? So if I grab onto that note and I get it, I'm like, oh, fantastic, that's great. If I haven't done that in a productive way, if I haven't done that with a good setup, what happens? As I get further through the, th the phrase, I might make a mistake somewhere else as I go for an ascending slur or an ascending interval or a larger leap. I'm not in position to be able to make that happen because I haven't started well. I haven't put the fundamentals in place at the beginning. So what I think is, oh, I've got a problem with that slur. But the problem actually started well before. Does that make sense? So if we can sort of think about this in the practice room and be aware of where did I actually, where did the problem initiate? Where was it born? Not where it showed its head. Not where it like, not where the mistake necessarily happened, but where was that mistake created? If we can approach our practice with these things in mind, then we're gonna be in better shape. And going, you know, reverse engineering this, if we always start with what are the ingredients that we want to have in place? Good breathing, good setup, good tongue position, good, simple articulation and a really good musical image because oftentimes you know we'll, we'll also miss an interval not because physically we're not set up but because we don't hear it we don't have enough clarity so developing this awareness in our practice will help us to solve these issues much much quicker any questions put them in the chat or just scream out yeah, interesting. Uh, Eric says uh, lighting in his practice room is important. And he said a light on the music in a dark room helps him. Yeah, that's that's a really good idea. The other thing is, and I'm looking around my room at the moment, and I won't show you because it's we've got it set up so that it actually looks quite nice through the camera. But if I were to turn the camera around, I've got like one, two, three, four, five piles of music there. I've got one, two, three horn cases there, three horn cases there, a horn case here, a laptop here, a desk there with windows in front. I'm, I've got this room perfectly set up to be distracted as much as possible. And that's not by design, that's just because I'm disorganized at the moment. But um, what I would encourage you to do is, is create a space 
that is as calming and as clear for you to be able to focus as possible. So as simple as you can. And do simple things like turn your phone off. Don't practice in front of the television. <laughs> Which is why it's interesting because we go back, when you, when you go back to your life as a, as a musician in university, you think, oh man, those practice rooms are so boring. I mean, it was just like this soundproof room and there might have been a piano in there and it was carpeted and it sounded awful. Actually, it seems like a pretty good place for you not to be distracted. So if you can create a good acoustic, that's great. But try and remove the clutter and also make spend a bit of time before you go into the practice room to just focus yourself, to just calm yourself down. Be aware of like if you've just been, you know, run out and done a bunch of errands and you're like, I've got to go do half hours practice, grab the instrument, jump in the room. Just take time to stop before you get in the room, preferably stop. OK, what do I want to achieve from this practice session? What am I working on? What is my plan? What am I going to do in this period of time? And then just take a couple of moments to center yourself, get yourself focused. And we talk about in the in the in the uh, summer course, uh, the summer program, we do a lot of work on mental preparation and centering and being able to focus. And we give you a lot of skills to help with that because this is such an important aspect. We spend hours in the practice room. We need to try and make sure that as much of that is productive as possible and taking us into the right direction. Okay, yes. Suzanne says, making a mistake after, after the difficult thing. Again, this is, a, this is the thing of creating awareness. We put this, we put this uh, focus on, I've got to survive, I've got to get through it. Oh, I got through it. <laughs> because we lose focus. Okay, being aware of that's great. In your practice, if you find yourself doing that, that's terrific. Then you can then you can put a plan together. Okay, I need to make sure I keep concentrating. You hear for horn players um, so often after they play the high note of a phrase. Then whoa, Shostakovich five. Beautiful high B, and then everything else is like whoa, it just falls apart. Okay, that's totally normal. That's totally normal, and it happens to a lot of people. But it doesn't mean that you can't put something in place to plan for that, to stay in the moment, to stay focused, if you're aware of it. And remember, this is the same with technique, it's the same with performance, it's the same with musicality. If you are not aware of something, you can't actively develop it, you can't actively make it into a habit and grow it, but also you can't fix it. If you don't know there's a problem, you're not gonna fix it, right? So creating this awareness in the practice room, awareness of where we are musically, awareness of where we are technically, and awareness of our mental side, then we're then we're going to be in good shape. Okay. Oops, I've frozen. Oh no, my beautiful slides have frozen. Oh, there we go. So moving to creating awareness for us or what is our awareness when we're on stage and this is you know this is a really interesting really interesting thing for me is the first thing that comes in for most of us when we're on stage and we're most of the time not even aware of it because we're having a conversation with it is the voice that happens in our head and if you think back to the last performance that you had, or the last audition, you probably were having a little chat with yourself at some point. Wow, I sound amazing. Wow, I'm so bad. Why did I make that mistake? I'm so stupid. Wow, what is the conductor doing? Why is that person in the front row like rolling up their program and they're not even and they're half asleep what are they anyone experience any of that normally that is followed by you making a mistake or something going wrong right so how do we fix it because it happens to all of us for me that voice is bob 
So I identify the voice. It's really important. Identify the voice. And then once I've identified it, I can, I can then separate it from me being involved in negotiating with him. So I say to Bob, thanks for your input, Bob. You can sit on my shoulder and I'll get back to you at the end of the concert because I've got work to do. So I acknowledge the voice. I acknowledge this internal chatter. And most of the time it manifests itself as negative self-talk. It normally comes in as like, uh, you're going to screw this up. Bain, like, you've, you've, you've never missed this solo ever before. Tonight is the night where you're going to screw it up. Anyone had that go through the head? Yeah, it's great. It's a great feeling, isn't it? it yeah, it's not. Um, so, so you know, the way that I I deal with that is is actually really simple. I acknowledge that it's there because if I don't acknowledge it, it's going to distract me. So I acknowledge it's there. I say, okay, that's fine. The reaction to that is I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on what I need to do. So for me, it's I'm gonna go back to my breath. I'm going to focus on breathing and making sure that I take a good breath. So it becomes a trigger for me. Oh, that voice means, okay, I need to focus and I need to get back to my breathing so that I've got some action rather than engaging in this conversation back and forth. No, I'm not going to screw it up. Yes, you are. No, you're not. It's like, you know, we end up with the who's on first skit, right? Which no one wants. So that's the voice in our head. We want to try and, you know, and, and again, we, we, we do a lot of a deep dive into this in, in, the, in the program uh, and giving you the tools that you're going to need to be able to deal with these, these issues. Or the other thing that comes into, into mind is when, when we make a mistake, what is our reaction? Most people's reaction is, oh, God, what? Ouch. Ah, ah, why did that happen? Why did I make that mistake? Oh, I know, it's because I did this and this and this, but how did that, I really, like, how can I, you know, how can I fix that again? You know what? Once you've made a mistake, there is nothing you can do about it. In a concert, absolutely nothing you can do. It's gone. Finished. So again, acknowledge it. <clears throat> yep, made a mistake. Okay, great. What's my job? Move on to the next note. Stick to the image that I had when I was in my conductor <clears throat> and singer mode. Get back to that. Because all that I can do is affect what comes next. I can't fix anything that just happened. I can't apologize for it. I went through a stage when I was in the Adelaide Symphony <clears throat> where, where I'd make a mistake and every time I make a mistake I'd stomp my foot to tell everyone that I knew that I'd made a mistake and I was upset by it. And after a couple of weeks of this, one of the musicians in the orchestra came up and said, look, um, everyone hears if you make a mistake. We know that you make a mistake and we also assume that you're not happy about it because, <laughs> because when we make mistakes, we're not happy about it. So you don't need to compound things by telling everyone that you, you know, in case you missed it, I made a mistake. Just get on with it. So if you make a mistake, don't compound your issues by trying to fix it because you can't. What you can do is stick to your plan, stick to your musical image and keep moving forward and focus on the very next thing. But acknowledge it. It's okay to acknowledge it because that then puts it in the past and we can move forward. Eric. Uh, I was playing the first word solo in a, in a concert for Tchaikovsky 5, and I think it's oboe, the duet part at the end, they made a mistake. And having to deal with that was interesting. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it can be very distracting when you're in a situation where someone else makes a mistake, particularly if it's just before you play or just after you play or if it's just in one of those stressful moments. And again, acknowledging it, and getting back into the moment of your focus is really important. Okay. Tension. 
this is one of the things that, that for me, I, know, I, I am very aware of this before concerts. And I, I get very edgy. If I've got a big concert coming up, I feel very edgy for most of the day. And I used to not realize this. And I, was, I became very short-tempered and very um, anxious early on in the day. And I'm like, why am I feeling anxious? Why do I feel like on, on edge? I wasn't nervous. But for me, that's how my nerves came out. Is I felt anxious, I felt tense, I felt, you know, not, you know, very, very intolerant. Now, being aware of that, that that's a symptom of me being nervous. I'm like, okay, great. I can go through my routines and I have a bunch of routines. And of course, we talk about this in the, in the summer program, um, giving you a bunch of skills to be able to recognize that, be aware of those tendencies, and then bring that level back down again so that it's not building up during the course of the day so that by the time you get to the concert and you feel nervous, you feel totally out of control. Has anyone felt that with nerves going into a concert where you just feel like you're just overwhelmed and there's nothing you can do to bring things down? Yeah. So this is this is normal. I used to go, I went through this when I was playing in the Adelaide Symphony in my first job. I went through about a two month period where I would sit on stage and I would be within a couple of seconds of needing to run off the stage and throw up. I, I worked myself up so much and I was so stressed about it. And this was like for a, you know, Mozart overture or something like it was not not concertos or anything really stressful it's just during the day I hadn't realized I built things up and I I and I hadn't addressed it because I wasn't aware of it I wasn't aware of how my nerves were creating this anxiety creating this stress so it had built up to a point where I just couldn't stop it and once it gets this is the thing that Dinka talks about in her sessions is once your anxiety level gets over a certain point you can't put that stuff back in a bottle. You can't you can't bring that back down to a manageable level. It's just it's then you're in the in the danger zone. So being able to be aware, creating awareness of what your tendencies are when you get nervous, and how to bring that down to a level that you can manage. And then as you get into the performance, obviously that will increase. The closer you get to the concert, it'll, the anxiety, the stress, the nervousness will get higher but you've got it at a level where you can manage it and then you're gonna to have tools to be able to deal with that. And I still get nervous, but I have an amazing set of tools that enables me to bring it down to a level what is, that is an optimal level for performance. Doesn't mean that I'm calm, not calm at all, and I don't wanna be calm. Because this is another thing that we talk, we talk about at length in the program is, is how to use this energy that we get from nervousness in a positive way to help your performance so that it is not something that is holding you back. It's not going to cripple you. Okay. And the last one is breathing. Just being aware as a winter brass player, almost always the first thing that goes is breathing. And you talk to people in master classes and, and in after performances and you say like, you know, how, what did you think about that? Yeah, I just, my breathing was just not really good. And again, it's this awareness of like, okay, so what is what is my goal going into this? So for me, and anyone who goes to LA Field Concert, you'll see this if you watch. I mean, it'd be boring to sit there and watch me for five minutes, but um, I, I will sit there and press my thumbs into the side of my ribs. I try not to do it too obviously, but if I'm nervous, that is a big tell. If you're in the audience and you see me doing that, you know that I'm nervous. What, what do I do that for? I do that to remind myself that this is what I want to expand. I want to feel that breath. So when I'm feeling nervous, my focus goes to my breathing. It does a couple of things. It distracts me a little bit from the fact that I'm nervous, but it actually makes sure that I establish the habit that I want to put in place when I'm performing. And it helps me to check into, yeah, I'm breathing. I have control over my breathing. My nerves don't. So I want to focus on this is how I want to breathe. This is how I want to be set up. And then I can put that in place. My computer's running very slow today. No, still not moving. Oh, there we go. So your assignment today, 
to create your awareness, other than your um, rubber band, right? Practice your piece or exit five times and note what distracts you. And this will get better as you do it more often. It might be, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, my tongue feels really weird or my chops feel really weird. If that's the case, or my, or my bow hand feels really weird. Again, re-engineer re, re what you're doing to establish what you want to put in place. So if I'm, if I'm focused that, oh, my chops don't feel so good, is that what I want to be focusing on? No, what I want to focus on is my breathing and my blowing. So have it be a trigger to, to steer you towards the habits and the qualities that you want to put in place. Or if it's like, wow, I'm playing along and I'm like, wow, this doesn't sound very good. Okay, so how am I going to deal with that? Acknowledge it, put it to one side, get back to what you need to do. Record your piece five times and note the distractions. Now there's going to be a different feeling between when you're practicing it and when you're playing it for recording. Recognize that. And this is where the voice will come in more strongly, I would suggest, because it becomes more of a performance situation. So that negative self-talk, the busyness of your, of your left brain will, will come into place. And then, this is something we're gonna work on tomorrow, uh, choose your favorite player of your instrument, or it can be another instrument if you like, or singer, or conductor, whatever, and perform your piece in that character. So my kids uh, today at their preschool or their daycare, they have, um, today is a superhero dress up day. So Jasper has dressed up as uh, Thor and Sebastian has dressed up as uh, Optimus Prime, which both kids call Ultimate Prime. I have no idea why that is, but that's how it is. And so put your Yasha Heifetz suit on or your Stefan Dor or Sarah Willis uh, suit on or your, I'm trying to think, your Tom Hooten suit on or your Bud Herseth suit on or Dennis Buryakov suit on and play your piece as them. Not you, not you dressed up as them, but you actually are impersonating them in the most expressive, clear way that you can. Choose someone, if you can, choose someone who's pretty demonstrative and you've got a very clear idea of how they go. My choice is always Stefan Dor because I've played with Stefan a lot and I've seen him perform a lot and I do a pretty good Stefan Dor impersonation. So that's, uh, that's my go-to for this. But just note how freeing that is when you play and how it affects your playing. It's really helpful. All right, I look forward to seeing your impersonation. And if if you put these in the in the put the videos in the in the Facebook group, please let us know who you are impersonating. There's a there's a really great one. Uh, there's a he's actually a very good international soloist, cello soloist. But he's got a there's a video on YouTube. If anyone can dig it up, bring it in tomorrow. Of of this guy playing as Yo Yo Ma and uh, Misha Maisky and uh, Kirschbaum and all the all the big uh, and Jacqueline Dupre all the big cello solos and he impersonates each of them and it's amazing. It is it, it's like so good and he plays incredibly well but the impersonations are awesome. So if you get a chance to check that out, I'll see if I can dig it up and I'll put it in the Facebook group. All right. So just a reminder: on Monday we have a, a masterclass with me. I know you've probably, at the end of this week, you've probably had enough of seeing me, but we, we're going to, uh, we're going to do some really cool stuff to tie all of this stuff together and expand on it. Um, and also it's going to be an opportunity for you to, uh, you know, to bring your thoughts about, about this week and how things have progressed over the weekend. So on Monday, and I think Rupal or Sammy, do you have the, do you have the link to that there and, and the time that it's on? Off the top of my head, I can't remember what time it is, but we will put that uh, in the chat and um, and let you guys know. It. But that's uh, that's on Monday morning. I think it's eight thirty or eight o'clock, one of the two. But I hope you can make that. All right, great. Is this helpful? Good stuff. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you for your 
participation and your energy with this. Enjoy experimenting with all these things and, uh, and creating more awareness in the practice room uh, and for your performance. So again, the, the, the assignment for today, practice room awareness and then the performance awareness basically for your recording. Um, and, then, and then enjoy your acting career. Great. All right. Thanks, everyone. So we'll wrap everything up tomorrow. Uh, see you the same time tomorrow morning and uh, have a great day. Thank you.